Leon, now let's, we will start today's lecture. Mm -hmm. Welcome, this is Subin Chiu and I'm a project consultant Leon, now, of the preparatory start. office for the International Center for the Interpretation and Presentation of World Heritage Sites under the auspices of UNESCO. Pleasure to meet you all at the 2020 online lecture series on understanding World Heritage Interpretation and Presentation. Thank you very much for joining today's lecture. As, as all of you may know, we all miss that one sunny day out with our friends and family. Until today, hope you all stay safe. Held twice a month until 26 November 2020. Please check the videos of the lectures by Neil Silberman. William Lurgan and Dr. Shumei Huang on our Facebook page and YouTube channel. Today, we will have a lecture with Dr. Wiji Ju, and there will be two more lectures with World Heritage Professionals. Please take a look at the Facebook page of the Preparatory Office for further information on the lectures. If you are joining the lecture on YouTube, you can find the link for Facebook page on the live streaming videos description. Now, if you have any questions about the lecture, please leave comments on our YouTube or Facebook's live streaming video. We will have time for questions after having the lecture. Now, I would like to give a brief introduction to our lecturer, Dr. Wijie Ju. Dr. Rijie Zhu, oh, sorry. Dr. Rijie Zhu is a senior lecturer at the Center for Heritage and Museum Studies, the Australian National University for Heritage Sites. He served as the vice president of the Association of Critical Heritage Studies to, to establish this wonderful center. Um, and I think this is a meaningful action and I wish organizations um, have a huge success. It is also my pleasure uh, to be here with you to share some of my thoughts about heritage interpretation. Um, so let me just uh, start sharing my screen. Mm -hmm. Can you see the screen? Yes, we can see your screen too. Okay. Um, this talk focuses on what heritage interpretation in the context of 1972 World Heritage Convention. And in details, um, I would like to address three issues here. Um, why World Heritage Interpretation is important? how to integrate heritage interpretation in the operation of World Heritage Convention, and uh, which kind of goals that we aim to achieve. Um, the 1972 World Heritage Convention was designed to protect outstanding examples of the world nature and cultural heritage. The idea behind the general the rapid change in innovation as part of modernity. Today, the 1972 World Heritage Convention guideline has been extensively revised. Terms such as cultural landscape, intangible heritage, and the cultural roots have been integrated to expand the meaning and scope of heritage. All of these changes reflect the global movement and the call for democracy, diversity, inclusiveness, and equality. This talk focuses on one of the evolution and challenges, the theme of the seminar series what heritage interpretation, or more broadly, heritage interpretation. As Neil Simmerman indicated in the first lecture, the term interpretation did not appear in the first text of the 1972 convention. Only the term presentation has appeared in article four and five, aligned with other actors, such as identification, protection, conservation, and transmission. In the recent years, the term interpretation has gradually become noticed as one of the key issues in international heritage guidelines and policies. 
In 2008, Ecomo's charter for the interpretation and presentation of cultural heritage sites was published to establish professional guidelines of interpretation and presentation. Here, we can see that it defined interpretation of heritage interpretation. Several events and meetings have been held, such as the International Conference on World Heritage in in Interpretation, in that heritage interpretation should be considered as an essential part of the management plan. As we've seen from examples in the past lectures, heritage interpretation is important not only because it offers a way of communication, but also by nature, I argue heritage interpretation is political. Heritage interpretation should be treated as a political form of recognition. As Charles Taylor and later Lancy Fraser indicated, Cultural recognition is the critical lens in discussing social justice. We are in a world that is full of issues and conflicts that are driven by social equality, racism, displacement, and discrimination. The current global pandemic has reinforced these issues. Some are historical wounds due to colonialism and wars in the past, while others are ongoing issues such as cultural imperialism, capitalism, and climate change. Similar like the recent discussion about Black Lives Matter, we need to engage with politics of recognition in heritage interpretation as it's fundamental in social justice through adjusting issues such as racism, colonialism, slavery, and violence. When we consider what heritage interpretation or does it include or exclude the voices from all members of communities such as elders, women, youths and the poor? Does heritage interpretation only represent the interests of the state parties where what heritage site is listed or located? Or can it reflect the needs and the voices from others? Does it only represent the story of the victory? Or can it engage with historical mistakes, problems, wounds, or other difficult and sometimes shameful past, such as wars, massacre, slavery, and exiles. All of these questions have indicated here that what heritage interpretation is crucial. It should not be merely an aesthetic declaration of, of what heritage listing or branding mechanism to attract tourism consumption. I repeat here, it does political work. Improper interpretation will not only reinforce historical wounds, but also create new scars and it's happening. It's need to be treated seriously as a form of recognition and a social justice, as it has serious consequence on how we understand our past, present, future, and our relationship with others. We know that heritage interpretation is important, but the question is how we integrate heritage interpretation in the operation of the World Heritage Convention. Here I argue that heritage interpretation should not be driven only by professionals and experts. Instead, heritage interpretation can be treated as a form of co-production. By co-production, I mean all stakeholders of heritage sites, especially the community as part of the interpretation process to provide the equitable and ethical identification of certain rights and freedom. The key issue of co-production is that heritage interpretation is dialogical. It can integrate both official and unofficial narrative in the production of heritage meaning and values. The first actor of co-production, both states and important, as they provide assessment, funding, and resources to support the production of heritage interpretation. Experts are necessary to undertake assessment and interpretation of heritage with specific criteria and standards. However, they are coordinators rather than leaders. They facilitate the dialogical work among the others. The second actor of co-production is local tour guides. Among different techniques of heritage interpretation, such as brochures, film, and music, Interactive engagement was the most successful form of engaging visitors on an emotional level and informative level at heritage sites. Tour guides, especially from local communities, 
do not merely communicate factual information. They perform and personify local culture and value from their own. They become facilitators in mediating the connection between physical sites, the built environment, and the culture and the social me meaning behind them. The third actor of co-production is local communities members. Heritage interpretation should also include local communities surrounding sites as part of co-production, as Silverman argued. Members of local communities, regardless of their gender or age, can be invited to participate in interpretation material to tell their own story to visitors. Action provides this group with opportunities to link their cultural tradition and life experience so as to strengthen their cultural identity and sense of belonging. This is particularly relevant to Aboriginal areas where indigenous culture and their communities are situated at the center of heritage interpretation. In this way, the interpretation of local history, knowledge, and the environment can follow the indigenous ontological vision of the world. Western philosophies, such as the division between nature and culture, and tangible and intangible. The fourth actors of co-production is visitors. Visitors can also engage in producing the interpretation of unique experience. As many scholars have argued, visitors are not passive information receivers. They can actively participate in recording their story and understanding of hitting with visitor books and online social medias. As shown here, the visitors notes in the recent exhibition at Australian National Museum about stories of the Captain Cook and the First National Australians, First Nation Australian, sorry. These stories written in the visitor booklets are integrated as part of the authentic and a valuable interpretation of heritage sites. All participants, local schools, tour guiders, communities, and visitors will be seen as potential co-producers in heritage interpretation. Here, all participants of heritage interpretation are viewed as collaborators and dialogical partners. Viewing heritage interpretation as co-production shifts the focus of interpretation from information and knowledge giving to the mediation of dialogues between different value and meanings. One more question still remains. What are the goals of heritage interpretation should be achieved? I argue that heritage interpretation should not only reflect and represent what we have done in the past, but also serve as a tool of social action to reorient our relation with the future and our relationship with others. To elaborate this, I did not develop here as a ladder of heritage, a model that illustrates different degrees that heritage interpretation can achieve. We read from below to above entertainment and consumption, knowledge and fact sharing, understanding of recognition, imagine reflection, reconciliation and healing. In the first level of the ladder, the practice organized by sites does not serve the goal of recognition. Sometimes heritage interpretation leads visitors for pleasure making and consumption. Last year, it that struck me during my visit at a third turn of DMZ, when some school children treat the place as a form of amusing park, something like they were at Disneyland. Similar things also happen and some reactment of what heritage sites, such as this in Rome. I do not intend to show that reactment is really wrong. On the opposite, it can be a very powerful instrument of heritage interpretation. However, we need to be careful with historical reactment. Using historian Greg Daniels' word, it sometimes only presents the past as merely the present in funny dress. I believe this is not only an issue of authenticity, but also an ethical issue about respect and recognition. The second letter is about information and fact sharing. This is often associated with the idea or presentation of her official heritage description developed by experts. We often seen like this, a chronicle structure of narrative that is displayed in the main board of heritage sites. It contains important information such as years and numbers, but is objective without emotion, factual without feelings. 
I often wonder how much information I actually remember after they visit. The third stage of heritage interpretation offers a deeper level of recognition and acknowledgement. It shows respect to affected communities. It gives answer to why certain historical events took place and acknowledge the reasons of such events. Such efforts allows people to understand and recognize the voices from different social groups. At Kung Fu Women Museum in Nanjing, the status itself become a form of heritage interpretation that recognizes the traumatic nature of the event and its impact on affected communities. The fourth stage of heritage interpretation moves beyond actual facts and knowledge. It enables visitors to transfer the boundaries between heritage and particular memory work that involves the process of imagination, commemoration, and reflection. Like this display in the Jewish Museum in Berlin, more than 10,000 heavy round iron plates cut in the form of faces with crying mouths cover the ground of the void. At this stage, the goals of heritage interpretation offer hot interpretation that includes imagination and reflection. Instead of facts truth giving, it engages with narrative and effects that make people feel understand. Narrative and stories are the key here. As Russo Steig argued, that narrative make material things the touchstone of our deepest desires, feelings, imaginations, and emotions. Stories are such a powerful way of connecting people to place and landscape, offering imagination and possibility to transcend the present towards the past and future. But I also emphasize here that it needs to be result of co-production and dialogical interaction because there is an axis of storytelling involved in the heritage interpretation process. Last but not least, the latter, interpretation potentially transform heritage to a spiritual space for healing and reconciliation. Like Shu Mei Huang mentioned in the last lecture, those social functions of heritage interpretation are particularly relevant to post-conflict sites that are associated with tragic events and human suffering, such as jails, concentration camps, battlefields, war memorials, and cemeteries. Such visits and interpretation have the potential for reconciliation within divided society or communities, and they help us to force the peace and reduce conflicts between different groups. As a form of co-production, scholars, family members should be invited to such heritage sites to discuss together what they mean for the societies in the past, present, and futures. Questions during this round table or workshop can include, how did these events actually happen? Who was at fault? Who were the victims? How have people suffered? How have such issues been recognized and settled? Or most importantly, how we can learn from the past to create a better future? Incorporating these questions requires courage and empathy. But only such a way of co-production allow us to engage with the recognition and interpretation of crucial and hidden knowledge of the past. For instance, here, the Kijaligi Genocide Memorial provides a transparent acceptance and recognition of the Rwanda genocide and devastating impact on the one ethnic group at another. Means reconciliation is also a crucial social, political, and cultural agenda in Australia with many Aboriginal art festivals and exhibitions being created ac across Australia to recognize the importance of reconciling indigenous and non-indigenous differences and histories. However, reconciliation is a complex and challenging work. It requires all stakeholders to work together to develop heritage interpretation strategies that acknowledge community well-being and the needs of the past societies, conflict societies. It should go beyond people's comfort zone and challenging our common sense. In another word, heritage interpretation should facilitate our critical thinking on values beyond individual nation states and industries. Otherwise, the social functional heritage interpretation can easily fall into superficial propaganda without meaningful impacts on local societies. For instance, founded by international organizations, the old bridge at most are demolishing 
during the Croat Bosnia work was reconstructed and nominated as World Heritage Site in 2005. The post war reconstruction of the bridge functioned as a powerful emblem of international cooperation and a co political unification between Bosnia and Herzegovina. However, local recognition of the bridge as a unifying feature between two powers is limited without actually creating effects of reconciliation and peacemaking as proposed. Therefore, the co-production of heritage interpretation for reconciliation and healing is a long journey for all related parties. The constructive narrative concerning the past required an assessment of the past from multiple points of view, so as to provide an open dialogue on relationship building, not only different nation states, but also between states and societies. Now I would like to summarize here. Heritage interpretation becomes fundamental when we address the question what heritage and museum does to the society and the world. We should not forget the original intention of 1972 World Heritage Commission. It's not as a tool of political and diplomatic power game, but as a mechanism acknowledgement and recognition. Heritage interpretation should not expert driven, but should be a form of co-production where communities situate at the center. It does not serve for pleasure making and consumption, but for learning. It's not only for understanding, but for feeling and reflection. The practice of heritage interpretation should not stay within but we should use it to test the boundary of our common knowledge for reflection and critical thinking about those difficult but important issues of the world, such as racism, colonialism, and violence. It does not always make us feel comfortable, but only through such a way, what heritage interpretation can serve as a social action to reorient the relationship with our past. But in partnership with social media, NGOs, education scholarship, and public engagement like what we're doing here at seminar series. Um, about a dialogue between different communities, societies, states. The co-production heritage interpretation can hopefully create a dialogical form of narrative that move beyond local and national interests, and instead to achieve a greater sense of outstanding universal value. I also like to use the opportunity to share some of my thoughts about the future of World Heritage Interpretation. There has been an emergence of the need for better digital technology to connect place and community virtually. These days, we have benefited from the digitalization of heritage or virtual museums during the period of pandemic lockdown. Many cultural activities, festivals, religious rituals and heritage programs have while many people embrace the convenience of digital technology, like we are doing here, to communicate and explore the world without actual traveling, such development proposes a new challenge for us to rethink how the past is interpreted and imagined. These new trends, including an even more substantial effect of inclusion and exclusion than ever. People who do not have sufficient resources to utilize this digital in the new normal, for instance, the idea of open access allows us to access different sorts of digital information without properly acknowledging and recognizing the ownership, rights, and feeling of affected communities, especially those indigenous elders and women. In other words, digitalization of cultural heritage has emerged as an even more powerful tool to reinforce and legitimize through ideologies. The emergence of digital heritage field will potentially increase new challenges for what heritage intervention and what heritage interpretation. I believe it requires us to think further about the nature of heritage interpretation and its impact on societies. We need a more critical view of ethical guidelines to navigate on the way we interpret the past. All the whole seminar series is just a start. A further critical ethical discussion is needed to review the consequence of what heritage interpretation on societies. We need to look for practical, but also critical approach 
that guide us in developing heritage interpretation as social actions to reorient our relationship with the past, present, and the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you for your um, oh. Thank you for your amazing lectures uh, so that people can understand the importance of world heritage and also the importance of uh, many and community voices and interpreting those on the world heritage interpretation. And our viewers left uh, questions on your lecture. So I'm gonna read the very first one now. Well, <clears throat> Karma Tanjin left the first question. The question was, I'm in Nepal. Here, there is hardly any interpretation at the World Heritage side. Many sides have bit between different communities who have conditions. Living interpretation to guys allows guys to speak privately with their guests, but the risk, but risk a one-sided and often Erroneous transfer of information. Can you suggest an example of similar sites and the solution used there? Okay, second question. Um, I think this is an important question for um, many heritage sites and many um, heritage tour guides, um, especially with active difficult uh, issues, right? Like, for instance, in Nepal, there was earthquakes other sides if there is um, difficult issues around in the past. Um, as I mentioned in the lecture, um, this is not should be a man, one man's game or one woman's game. The co-production or a dialogue at sites or heritage interpretation or tools has ha happened. Um, there should be a a, not a training, but or more like a, a conversation how to interpret it what, what happened of their personal stories and what happened in the past. Doesn't matter, this is a, 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 a difficult issues or happy issues. Um, we should be careful, especially if the two guys from local communities. Um, of course, and, and that uh, personal experience are very useful. We have to acknowledge the ethical around that. We affect or um, negatively to, to the feelings and emotion of those affected communities. Also, uh, especially in post-disaster areas, um, it's kind of a useful way to interpret uh, the, the events. Um, if there was a, a smooth uh, communication happened between the visitors and to, and I think there's a lot of trends um, around post-disaster um, heritage, and. And I think UNESCO, regional office of UNESCO, is if we talk about Nepal, there's a regional office in Asia, is engaging with that since 2006, and they're doing trainings for a lot of heritage sites, and 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 and, and there a lot of important work has been done. But I think it's important that, especially to these sensitive issues, we need to be clear and straightforward and quickly make action plans. Thank you for your answer for the first question, Professor, <clears throat> and. And our viewers, the second question on our Facebook. Um, it's the question left by, I'm sorry, mm, I'm not sure I'm reading it, but uh, the second question was left by Melinda Harloff. And the question was, when interpretation is only through objects and text and aims to focus on narratives, emotions and modest reactions and contemplation, how can it be multivocal, including more than one voice, especially when the target audience or visitors have diverse amount of information? Yeah, um, that's very important too. I think it's, um, it's an important question. There are two issues here. First is the techniques of interpretation, which means which kind of ways we translate the, the language of the information. And I mentioned in the lecture that we can use different ways. Uh, we can use films, medias, not only objects and text, but also um, we can use feelings, uh, touching the stones, 
for instance, uh, people just traveling by their own or, or uh, listen to uh, music or, or watching a movie. Uh, that's the first issue. That's about techniques. What what Melinda here is, is, is developing is about how we develop multi vocal or what I think we're trying to say is how we have inclusive voices, how we have multiple uh, 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 voices. This is very important issues that uh, usually museum or heritage sites have one voice um, or one official interpretation of what we call professional. And, and that often leads to a certain sense of high culture or official version of the historical narrative. But I think what we should think about is a way to encourage dialogue or, or um, uh, plural meanings. And instead of giving uh, um, payments, we, we can pose questions in the pose question in the in the museum or heritage sites to facilitate pe for people to think about giving answers. Usually I said in, in the lecture that when you get information, you forget right away. But when I think about these ideas, questions, and these questions will, 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 will keep with me and I will, I will transform them into other ideas. Um, I think that's more important. So just give you an example. If we, um, in a, any woman museum or war memorial, if we just criticize the war without really think why human beings create war or why we create disasters. If, if heritage interpretation can facilitate such kind of questions and as reflection and thinking and imagination, that's more meaningful than just giving information and facts. But of course, I think each nation states or, or sites have different stages. Some are more import, uh, interested in uh, we should never forget. I think that's important. We should never forget some issues which happened in the past. But we also should think about what we can learn from the past for other for future stage, stage, stages. Yeah, thank you for your answer. Um, and, oops. and there's the third question. And this question was from uh, Nam, Nam Un Kim. And the question was, and on official dialogue between communities of different nationalities be reflected in pre-published world heritage interpretation formulated by national initiative? Yeah, um, this actually addressed the key issue of this whole lecture. Um, we acknowledge that uh, the, of the existence of the official narrative of heritage interpretation at World Heritage Sites. So we often seen them in the information board or in an entrance of the museum or what heritage sites. But we should also include other voices, um, not the, the narrative written by careers or professionals, archeologists or, or experts. But also we can include oral histories from the communities. We can include um, voices from the visitors. Um, if we can create dialogue between the different visitors for visitors um, can, Question on our Facebook, and the question was, thank you for your presentation. Um, could you recommend some good readings or other case studies that will look into the emotional outcomes of interpretation and long-term? Uh, long-term transformative impacts on communities? I sometimes feel that measuring outcomes of interpretation is quite difficult to do. Yeah. That was the question. So there, thank you. Um, there's quite a lot of literature about heritage interpretation and emotion. Uh, just list some here. Um, for instance, um, Laura Jen Smith um, just had a new book out about heritage and emotion by Rollage. And also um, um, Professor William Logan, who presented here, they had a very nice edited volume on, on difficult sites and dark heritage sites, which has touched upon a lot of emotion issues. Um, I, I remember there's another book called Heritage That Hurts, uh, which mm -hmm. is talking about particular difficult heritage which hurt people and why uh, facilitate dialogue between key issues here. I do believe that uh, mediators such as the center um, um, could be a good mediator to facilitate that role. Great. 
Thank you for answering the questions and thank you all for leaving questions on the lecture for today. And we genuinely appreciate for your wonderful lecture. Thank you very much for the experience. to have you on our online lecture series. And thank you all for who are joining the, today's lectures. Uh, and oops. thank you all for joining today's lecture. And the next lecture under the agenda, Minority Inclusive World Heritage Interpretation, will be on 12 November. Dr. Peter B. Larson will be the lecturer for that day and be held at 6 KST and 10 AM CET. Please check the Facebook channel of the Territory Office for further information on the lecture series. Mm, and we apologize that our channel, uh, our internet connection has been uh, bad today. So thank you all for staying the lecture with this inconvenience. And we will unload the clean version of today's lecture right after the lecture finishes. Thank you all for joining today's lecture and let's meet up again at our next lecture. Thank you all for joining us today. Bye. <laughs>